The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. In this episode of You're Included, Dr. Thomas Noble, author of Holy Trinity, Holy People, The Theology of Christian Perfecting, helps us understand the connection between holiness and love. He discusses the importance of defining holiness within the context of the Trinitarian relationship. Our host is Dr. Gary Detto. Tom, it's great to have you here for this uh, session of here. You're Included. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know you're currently serving as a professor of theology at Nazarene the Theological Seminary. Uh, in the States here in Kansas City, mm -hmm. but you also go back and forth across that ocean quite a bit because you yes. also live, as your primary residence, right? Yes. Is uh, in Manchester. That's right. Where yes. you are a visiting lecturer and a, a PhD research supervisor right. as the well. the latter, PhD supervisor. Yes, supervisor. <clears throat> they call me a research fellow there. Ah, okay. Uh, but I don't actually do any lecturing there. I haven't done for some couple of decades. So, uh, but I, I'm and I, I'm also a research professor at the seminary mm -hmm. in Kansas City. So I teach very little there, down to one course a year. So my main focus is on supervising PhD research mm -hmm. and writing. So supervising other people's yes <laughs> yes work, but that's that's an important work itself. My Myself, having had a very good supervisor in James ah. Torrance ah, when I was yes. at Aberdeen, I yes, yes, know yes, how yes. important actually mm -hmm. that is. It, That's true. It makes or breaks yes. <laughs> yes. some PhD candidates. Yes. So I'm sure many are have been uh, mm. very grateful uh, for that. You did mention uh, writing, mm. and I have very much enjoyed reading uh, your book. Now it's been out for a couple couple of years. Six now. years, I think. That, yes. It's been that yeah, that yeah. long. Well. Mm -hmm. I right. think I read it only about three years ago. Okay. Maybe I was a little okay. bit late on the uptake. Right. But uh, the title there, uh, Holy Trinity and Holy People, uh, mm -hmm. The Theology of Christian Perfecting. Yes. Now, that, that's a pretty interesting. I don't hear a lot of talk about holiness. There are some churches and circles where mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. an emphasis. But I, I don't hear a lot about that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it's interesting here, right in the title, Holy Trinity, mm. holy, holy People, mm -hmm. and I know that's something you explore extensively yes. in the book. But tell us, where does that book come from? Why did you pick uh, that topic and, and want to write a whole book on it? Well, that largely comes from the tradition I grew up in and within which I teach in the Church of the Nazarene, which arose out of the 19th century holiness movement. Uh, now, that began in the Wesleyan Methodist Church, so it's Methodist tradition, but it actually spread cross-denominationally in the late 19th century. Mm. So it took all sorts of forms, from Finney to the Keswick movement in England and so on. But uh, the tradition I grew up in was specifically the Wesleyan mm -hmm. holiness tradition, mm -hmm. with this uh, emphasis on sanctification. So you're, you're really pursuing that. Uh, is this yes. kind of a summary of kind of where you've come to over the years? Well, or? I think that's right. You could say that since my childhood, I have been listening to sermons and testimonies and so on, people speaking about sanctification and Christian holiness. And so uh, very often that was presented in an individualistic kind of way. Mm. Um, but through my studies with the Torrances at New College Edinburgh, I began to see the importance of putting that in the context of the overall structure of Christian theology, which was Trinitarian. And uh, too often in the past we have kind of talked about the holiness of the Christian quite separate from the Holy Trinity. The Trinity hasn't played any part um, or much part in our understanding of the holiness of the individual Christian. So it was bringing those two together and also the title brings out the point that it's holy people, not just holy individuals. So we mm. can only understand uh, the holiness of each person within the context of the people of God, the church. Now that's particularly important in the Wesleyan tradition because Wesley defined holiness as not just holy behavior, but fullness of love. And you cannot talk about that 
in a purely individualistic sense. If you're mm. talking about mm. love, you've got to talk about relationships, so mm. you've got to talk about community. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was an attempt to um, develop the tradition in which I grew up, in which I represent, and the institutions I teach in, uh, but to develop it in a way that emphasised the importance of the church and that all of this has to be set in a Trinitarian context. Yes, that, well, that would be, I mean, I know my own background and upbringing, yeah, very much. I mean, holiness can, is often reduced to morality, for instance. Yes, yes. And the individual moral behavior. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think that very much. Mm. Now, do you make a distinction between kind of holiness? I didn't grow up in a holiness mm -hmm. uh, tradition. Yes. But we did talk about occasionally sanctification. Yes. Well, every it's, tradition does. Uh, right. Now, do you make some distinction? Or do you say that's essentially when you're talking about the people, uh, sanctification, holiness is essentially the same? Oh, yes. Uh, across the, the uh, um, spectrum of Christian belief, um, I think one of the mistakes our tradition has been made, has made, is to emphasize its distinctiveness. Uh, and, you know, we say uh, this and this is different from everybody else. Mm. I'm interested in an ecumenical understanding that helps us in the Western tradition to value what is being said in the Reformed tradition, the Lutheran tradition, and so on, uh, and to help them to value what we are saying. Some years ago, there were two books published, one with a title, the other with a subtitle, Five Views of Christian Sanctification. Now, that's fine, and that's good, but I'm interested in, can we, can we um, understand each other? Is there a, a possible unifying that can take place here in which we see the value that each tradition brings to the table? Yes, I actually know that particular book uh -huh. uh, as well. And it, I, it does have a value. Yes. But uh, there, yes, there must be some central meaning, some yes. central significance, yes. some coherent reality that right. we're trying to talk about, even if we have difficulty yes. uh, deciding how to, how to talk about it or right uh, how to uh, approach it and of course I mean it's it's kind of standard to say is well the church hasn't really come to a consensus uh, on that right. but of course it's not going to come to a consensus if we're all emphasizing our individual separate yes. views that's yes. not going yes. to help so I can see how uh, what you were writing mm -hmm. is moving in a different direction to try to uh, bring things uh, together um, I think also kind of holiness is often the, just the, the popular view, you know, is you can't act, holiness and love are opposed to one another. Someone yes. that's concerned yes. about holiness mm -hmm. is not going to love anybody. No, 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 uh, no. It can be so very judgmental, legalistic, yes, and my own tradition fell into that and became very legalistic. So how do we, how do we talk about that? How do we get past that? How do we see the connection? Uh, yes. between holiness and love. They're not fighting against each other. No. No, you cannot reduce one to the other totally. Um, you cannot say holiness is merely love because then that becomes something quite sentimental. Mm. So the holiness of God uh, um, means that he is holy fire. Uh, and so um, he, the, the warmth of his love comes to us but that same holy fire will burn up all that is opposed to it. So evil um, will be destroyed by the holy fire of God. So it doesn't mean to say that there is no element of judgment. I think that's sometimes the problem that we polarize mm. the two. Mm -hmm. And it's either all love and all positive, or it's all judgment and damnation and hell. Uh, and we've got to see that, that it's precisely because God is love, First John, that he will not admit destructive evil to his kingdom. And so there has to be the going through the fire. So I, I, I think, no, the other mistake, of course, is so to emphasize the negative side, if you like, the judgment, the negativity, what's excluded, that you fail to see that's not the heart of holiness. The heart of holiness is the love of God. And seeing that in a Trinitarian context, therefore, mm -hmm we see that love is not just something that God um, evidences externally, as it were, to us. Um, if that were the case, 
then it could be something incidental to his nature. But the love of God is seen in that. It is the love of the Father for the Son and the Son from the Father within the unity of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And so holiness is not just something that negatively reacts against sin. If mm. uh, holiness were merely separation from sin, and you know that the root of the Hebrew word is separation, but if, if, if holiness were only separation from sin, then how could God be holy before there were sinful creatures to be separate from. Mm -hmm. So you have mm -hmm. to have a more positive understanding. Mm -hmm. And um, the love of the Father for the Son, the Son for the Father within the unity of the Holy Spirit, I think uh, helps us to understand that God is love in himself, internally, in his very being, essentially. And so if we are to be, if be, be holy, for I am holy, Leviticus to mm -hmm. law to uh, the Israelites, um, if we are to be holy, it can only be because His Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and remakes us in the image of Jesus. So, right, so yeah, holiness, would you, could you say that holiness is the, is the particular quality or a quality, the quality of God's love? That's the kind of love it is. Would that, yes. would that work? Exactly, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Um, P.T. Forsyth, Congregationalist theologian, yes. mm -hmm. um, famously said, reacting against 19th century liberalism, which was very hot on love, and P.T. Forsyth said, it is not enough to say God is love. We must say God is holy love. Right, I can I remember James Torrance actually. <laughs> uh, yes. Referring us to P.T. Forsyth. Yes, yes. On exactly. In Aberdeen, of course, where yes, Forsyth came from. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, on exactly that topic. It's, uh, I think, very important. But it's hard for people to get a grip of because they keep mm -hmm. hearing it in this dichotomous mm -hmm. uh, fashion and, and then try to wrestle, yeah. uh, wrestle mm -hmm. with it. Uh, you talked about uh, your Wesleyan uh, background. Mm -hmm. Yes. And all. And that, and I know in certain circles, if people are aware of it, they, they hear about Wesley's doctrine of perfection. Yes. And some people are attracted to it, mm -hmm, and other people mm -hmm. are repelled by it. But in reading your book, uh, it, it became clear to me is that those, who, some who are attracted to it, and some who are repelled to it, actually have a rather shallow or maybe even a misunderstanding of what Wesley was getting at. Can you tell us a little bit about, yeah, what was Wesley getting at? Christian right. uh, perfection. perfection. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing to say is to disabuse people of the idea that we are talking about sinless perfection. There is a sinless perfection we will only have in the hereafter. But the good news of the gospel is that we will have it in the hereafter. <laughs> <laughs> and that is only possible because of the cross of Christ. But in the meantime, in this world, in this life, um, I think it's important to get the biblical concept here. And the Greek word for perfection, teleosis, the adjective is teleos, comes from the root telos, meaning an end or a goal. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's very helpful because Wesley's understanding of Christian perfection, Christian teleosis, is inherited from the fathers and from the medieval theologians, Aquinas and uh, Bernard of Clairvaux and so on. And it's the idea that the only perfection available to us in this life is not a perfection of performance. It's a perfection of intention, the intentions of the heart. So that while we always still live in this fallen flesh, while we are in this world, nonetheless, um, Wesley believed from his study of the Old and New Testament that the gift of God was such that he could fill our hearts with his Holy Spirit in such a way that the Shema was fulfilled, that we could love God with all the heart, soul, mind and strength. Now, that didn't mean that we were beyond temptation. It didn't mean we were beyond falling. It didn't mean we, were, uh, we performed perfectly. But it meant that we no longer lived with a divided heart being pulled two ways. Uh, you know the text from James that the, um, the two-souled man uh, mm -hmm. is unstable in all his ways. 
So it's this unifying of the intentions and love and motivation around this all-consuming passion to love God, to serve God. That's, that's the concept mm -hmm. that, that Wesley gained early on. I think it is important uh, to say, however, he used the word Christian perfection. I quite deliberately changed that in the subtitle of the book to Christian perfecting mm -hmm. in order to get away from the idea that we ever reach sinless perfection in this life. And very often in the New Translations, uh, the word teleosis is translated maturity or teleos is mm. translated mature. Mm -hmm. Now that's right, that's true, that's part of the meaning of the word, mm -hmm. but it's not the whole meaning of the word. It doesn't capture this idea of a focus on one goal that, that, uh, that uh, shapes the whole of the life. Mm. I use the illustration in the book of the golf ball. When you hit a hole in one on those rare occasions, which never happen, <laughs> 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 once the ball is in the hole, that was a perfect shot. But it has to have a perfect trajectory to get to the hole. Now, within this life, what we're talking about is not a sort of static state of having arrived at absolute perfection. We're talking about what Paul expressed in Philippians 3 as this one thing I do. Mm. So there are lots of other things we do in life, but everything is integrated around this one passion to love God with all the heart, soul, mind and strength and our neighbours ourselves. Now that's the heart of Wesley's concept. Mm -hmm. And it's not unique to him, it's inherited from the fathers and the medievals. Yeah, so he deliberately went back. Yes. Yeah, it wasn't yes, accidental. Oh, I no, mean, no, yeah, no, no, so, no. Yeah. There was quite a recovery of patristic studies mm -hmm. in the Church of England in the 18th century particularly because they were keen to argue against the Roman Catholics, that they, the Anglicans, were the true Catholics. So <laughs> they became very interested in the Fathers. And Wesley was part of that revival of patristic mm -hmm. studies. All right, interesting. Now, I know these days there's an interest in spirituality. Yes. Uh, but I find that people mean a wide range of things, not only in conversation, mm. uh, but uh, also... Uh, in, in teaching and preaching. Um, and of course, some people even who don't have any background in the church, others, mm -hmm. had, I've had people say to me as well, I don't know about, I, I'm so interested in God or Jesus, but I'm interested in spirituality. Yes. You know, so there's a huge wide range. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do, how do we ad address that? What would be a, a kind of a Christian approach to spirituality and how would it relate to sanctification and others, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yes. What, what do we do with this word that's right. used in so many ways? Well, I think a lot of people uh, have become keen on it because it's a way of reacting against the tendency to reduce the human to the mechanical. So if you can fully explain the human being um, and of course, the social sciences are out to explain human behavior and so on. But if you can fully explain a human being, then you would appear to have turned that human being into some kind of machine. So I think the search after spirituality comes from a sense that there is mystery about life, about the world, and that we cannot tie everything down. I think that's, so we're not to reduce everything. And of course, mm -hmm. that's uh, uh, really, you can root, see that rooted in the Romantic movement, Wordsworth and all the rest of it, um, Beethoven and so on. And so for humanists, their spirituality is in the arts. Mm -hmm. um, now, that is quite understandable and in its own way commendable that they should realize that there's more to human being that can be taken down or explained mechanically. But yes, that, that's good. However, there is, from a Christian point of view, uh, the danger there that a kind of spirituality emerges which is purely humanly based and therefore is susceptible to various forms of evil. And so for Christians, the whole area of spirituality has to be linked to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who is the Lord, that is, he is God, and the giver of life. And of course, the word spirit in the original languages means breath. 
So the breath of life, he is the source of the breath of life. So yes, there is mystery here. You cannot put the Holy Spirit into a box any more than you can put the wind into a box. The pneuma, the wind, the spirit blows where it will. That also um, brings us to the point that Christian theology can therefore never be a totally logical system that explains everything without remainder. There is always that element of mystery about God. And um, Christian spirituality, therefore, um, uh, is a word which you can use to apply to the spiritual practices of the church. Prayer, singing of hymns and psalms of praise to God, worship, all of that is part of spirituality. And of course, we have such a rich heritage of hymns and verse and liturgies and uh, beautiful writings, spiritual writings that can help us to engage uh, until we enter into that sense of the presence of God, either corporately or personally. So in the sense that spirituality um, is a matter of sensing the presence of the Spirit, who is of course the Spirit of Christ. There is no other Spirit. Okay. And by the Spirit, we come to the Father, but through the Son, and all three are essential. So there's no independent Spirit wafting here that is other than the Spirit of Christ. Um, the Spirit brings us into the presence of Christ, uh, into the body of Christ, where through Christ we come to know God as Abba, Father. Um, so you cannot detach spirituality from that Trinitarian mm -hmm. gospel. Ah, that brings us back to the Trinity, doesn't yes, it? Yes, right. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Tom. It's been great talking with you. My pleasure. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.